Okay. It's all right? Okay, yeah? Thank you, yeah. Yes, forgot to press the button. <laughs> Amen. We all have to have this so-called Beatitudes inscribed in our heart is that we will not forget. And not only not to forget, but it will become a very part of our life. And, uh, they are very, very necessary for us to be able to fulfill the things written after these verses, chapter 5, 6, and 7. If we don't have these virtues of Christ, if we are not enjoying the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is impossible to fulfill anything, any of these, not just a righteous requirement, but even higher than the righteousness of the written law. Right? Remember, the Lord said, unless our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, we shall by no means enter into the kingdom of the heavens. Serious. These are serious warning for every one of us. Right? Uh, don't think the Lord is so merciful that he will just let anyone enter. No. Later on you read in Matthew chapter 25, the ten virgins. Did they all enter in? No. Five entered in. The other five did not. What about all the servants? Right. The last one, the Lord says, throw him out into the outer darkness. So, we need to take heed to the serious warning of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not a matter of just salvation to be forgiven of all our sins, but positively it is about entering into the kingdom. To be saved, it is by grace you don't have to do anything you just have to receive what the Lord has done for you on the cross. But to enter into the kingdom, there's a lot of requirements according to Matthew chapters 5 to 7. Even not just that, and the writings of Paul, the writings of Peter. We have to be diligent. Right? We have to be sanctified. We have to become a people who is holy as he is holy. And we need to be perfect as our Father is perfect. You cannot go around it. And you have no excuse because he has given us everything pertaining to righteousness, pertaining to godliness, pertaining to holiness. He has given us of his divine nature. Uh, what else could God give you that, that you would need to make it? Let us read again Second Peter. I think for everyone here this morning, it's always good to be reminded, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Or <coughs> three and four. Let us read it to ourselves, each one to himself, but let us read it out loud with the consciousness. Right? As his divine power, let's read, has given to me, okay? Not just to us, but let's be even more personal. Let us read has given to me. If you say to us, well, it is still a little bit too general. Oh, yeah, to us. Right? Not so specific. But if you read to me, 
you will have no more excuse to tell the Lord. You give to Timo, but you didn't give it to me. <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's read it slowly. As his divine power has given to me, to me, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called me by his glory and virtue, by which he has been given to me exceedingly great and precious promises, that through this I may be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So what are the things given to me? Given to you. All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called me, you and me, by his glory and virtues. He has even given us and shown us his glory and his virtues. So what do you lack? Stefan, what do you need? What is lacking? Can you make it, BJ? You have to say yes. With all of this equipment, you lack nothing. You lack nothing. The country will not send a soldier into war without equipping the soldier with the best and the most modern weapon. Right? He will not just give you a razor blade and says, okay, go and then go to war. <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> you can't win the war. But he equipped you with everything. Everything that you need. By which have been given to me and to you exceedingly great and precious promises. Every one of these words in the Bible is a promise given by God to you. It's up to you if you want to claim it or not. If you don't want to claim it, you don't take it, you don't make use of it, then one day, if you cannot get in to the kingdom, what excuse would you have? Lord, I, I lack this. Lord, I... <laughs> the Lord says, well, <laughs> I have given it to you. Why didn't you take it? that through these you may be partakers, meaning to say, if you would take advantage of all these things, you will become a partaker. It will become not just yours objectively, but it will become your life and your experience. If you have a German cake right in front of you, it is given to you free of charge at your birthday. Your birthday, it's your birthday gift. A black forest cake baked by Na Amy Strobel. <laughs> but if you don't eat it, it may be yours, but if you don't eat it, you are not a partaker. What are you going to do with the cake? Put it in your closet? You put it in your closet for three weeks, it will melt, it will become rotten, <laughs> not edible. It won't be edible. You have to be a partaker. That means you have to eat it. You have to get it into you so that it will become a constituent in your life. It will become your nature you will be a partaker of that very nature of Christ given to me, to you, to all of us. But if we are not a partaker, we just have it and put it away somewhere. 
Oh, yeah, I know, I know, you know. Every, every children like to say, I know. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. That's not a problem. It's not that you don't know, but you don't partake of it. You don't exercise so that it will become your reality, your substance, your essence. The Lord has really given to me so much, and yet I don't appreciate it. I don't treasure it like what we heard last night. I don't eat it every day. You know, some dear saints in Korea give us some very precious, expensive ginseng. You know, after I came home, I put it in a closet, in a closet in the guest room, somewhere there. And it's sitting there for one whole year, and the closet became very healthy. <laughs> but I became sick. I got sick. The king's thing did not help me, although I got it. It's a wonderful gift given to me, even free of charge, my goodness. But I put it, I put it in the closet. Yeah, it's, it's in your room there. How would that Korean pure, wonderful ginseng extract help me if it is in the closet? Huh? How would all the knowledge that you know concerning the Bible and the Word of God going to help you if you don't apply it, eat it, take it? And you have so much and so many opportunities to apply it, but you don't apply it. If you don't, you are not going to be healthy. It will even kill you, yes, if you don't apply it. And it says, Expiration date. Oh, oh, there's even an expiration date. So when I one day took it out, I don't know Korean. So what what does it mean that date? Is it the, is it the manufacturing date or is it expiration date? And uh, my wife found out because he, she was trying to learn a few uh, uh, Korean alphabet. And it sounded like Chinese. <laughs> it says expiration date. Dao <laughs> Qi, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I said, oh, goodness. <laughs> I'm so glad that the heavenly goods, these wonderful goods, they don't have an expiration date. So please, make use of it quickly. Make use of it quickly. Apply it, take it every day. So even these few days we forgot, a couple of days, right? So, uh, because guests are coming, uh, let's open one. <laughs> But even after it's open, we forgot to take <laughs> it <laughs> every morning. <laughs> and this, this is uh, what we do in our spiritual life. The candies, the Nutella, chocolate, we don't forget. <laughs> oh, we don't forget chocolate. Over Maltine. Wow. <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? Every morning, right? Where is it? Uh, where is it? <laughs> you, you like those things, but those things are not very healthy for you. But ginseng, nobody asks. Where is the ginseng? <laughs> nobody <laughs> And it doesn't taste very good, right? <laughs> and 
Stefan says, oh, I can't take that because it makes me hot. <laughs> it makes you hot? Yes. You take the heavenly fruit, it makes you burning, <laughs> burning in the spirit. <laughs> yes. So many other things we don't appreciate. But now I hope that we appreciate those wonderful verses in Matthew chapter 5. They should taste very sweet, especially the first verse. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is a very important nature in our being. It gives us the appetite. It makes us hungry for the heavenly things. If you don't realize that you're poor, you need it. If you don't realize that, Lord, I'm lacking in so many things. I failed in so many aspects. Right? And concerning all of these that we read and fellowship about this few days, if you're not poor in spirit, and you just put it in the head as just the knowledge, but you don't really felt the need, Lord, I need this because I want to enter into the kingdom, then you won't make it. Right. So all these blessed things, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, a peacemaker, willing to suffer, to be persecuted. If we don't have this nature and virtues wrought into us, you, you cannot fulfill the higher requirements that will not become a part of your being. Not possible. Right. So uh, that's why this morning, at the very last day, I thought we better go back to these verses, not to talk about it, but to read it, to read it. And hopefully, uh, we believe that the Holy Spirit will write it into our hearts. Now let's come to chapter 7, the last chapter. What does it say? Let us read. Verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. The word judge here is not like the judge in the court judging what is right and what is wrong, who committed a sin, a crime, who broke the law. It is not this kind of a judgment. But it is more of, in our present day language, Criticizing. You like to criticize others, and especially according to your standard, according to what you like, what, how you feel is good. Right? If I like to wear a certain dress, or a certain shirt, or certain pants, and I saw somebody wearing uh, I don't know what. I begin to say, well, why did why did he or she wear such a clothes? I'm judging that person according to my likes and dislikes. And we like to do that so much. The kingdom people should not do that. That would cause so much trouble. Really. That would cause unrest. That will cause reaction. That will cause division. That will cause offense. Right? 
that will cause offense. This is a meeting time. Why did you wear jeans to the meeting? <sighs> I begin to judge him. And you wear a leather jacket. Uh, do you belong to that motorcycle gang? <laughs> <sighs> I begin to judge. Just by closing, I begin to judge people and criticize. We like to talk about others. Why not talk about the Lord? Why do you talk about others? Right? Why you forgot to shave this morning? Hmm. Everybody shaved this morning. <laughs> right. We like to criticize according to my personal standard. I like to criticize. Yeah. And this is not good. We should not do this. Judge not. And uh, in the book of Romans, it does tell us, Paul tells us not to judge. Don't judge. Now let's take a look at chapter 12 of the book of Romans. <coughs> you know, if you do that, of course, that means you think you are better than the others, right? Otherwise, I won't criticize you. Uh, if, if I criticize you, it means I'm better. My consciousness is I'm much better than you are. And that's why I criticize you. Uh, if I criticize you, why, do you, why are you a vegetarian? You're a vegan. Why don't you eat meat? Mm -hmm. right. Even eating we criticize. And this is what happened here in Romans chapter 12. Let us just read <coughs> a few verses here. Amen, Lord. Teach us. Lord Jesus. <coughs> oh, where am I? I'm 14, I'm sorry. And I'm, not 12. Well, I'm still asleep this morning. Verse 4. Who are you to judge another servant? Oh, who are you to judge another servant? Each one of us is a servant of the Lord. To his own master he stands or falls. Yeah. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, and another person esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. He who gives God thanks, right? For he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself, etc. Right? So verse 10, and why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? You know, be careful, because if I, if I criticize a brother, that shows a taste of contempt. I'm looking down on that person. I'm looking down on that person. And it is not good. This is not the attitude of a kingdom people, of the kingdom people. Why do you show contempt for your brother? 
For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right. And then in verse 12, So then each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Don't have to take care about the others, but you take care of yourself. Therefore, let us not criticize or judge one another anymore. Don't do it anymore, no longer. But rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Yeah? If we criticize, we will cause someone to fall. And this is not good. This is not good. May the Lord help us. May the Lord really help us. Don't think this is uh, a small thing. In this section, it is talking about our relationship to one another, especially in the church life. And not only that, uh, but also to others who are not here in the church. If we have learned how to criticize one another here, then we should also learn how to criticize others. I don't mean we should not discern what is right and what is wrong. To discern is one thing, but to judge and to show contempt, that is not good. We have to learn even not to want to hear criticism. You know, our ears are very slow to hear what the Spirit is speaking. But if somebody is gossiping, all of a sudden my ears that were sleeping would wake up. And like an elephant ear, all of a sudden flap up. Usually the elephant ears are down. It's too heavy. But when the gossip and criticism about somebody comes... What? What? Who, who, who are you talking about? What is it? What is it? And, and uh, really, really? Wow. Why? And then after I hear it, I begin to tell Chan. And so the story went around. And when that person hears it, it becomes a stumbling block for that person. What? Is that the church? And we have a problem. And we sin against the Lord. Watch what we say with our lips. Things that are not helpful, not encouraging, not helping others, not about our Lord or not supplying help, better not say it. No. Seasoned with salt, like our brother shared, uh, let our words be seasoned with salt, supplying grace to the hearers. O oh Lord, may the Lord have mercy on us. And then the warning is this, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. Yeah, you will be judged. And it will come around to you. <laughs> and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Right. Oh Lord. Then verse 3. Why do you look at a speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Now let me ask you, and myself, are we perfect? Are we perfect? 
You know, it's very strange uh, what the Lord here is saying, that we always see the fault of others. But we cannot see our own fault. Or even if we see it, uh, we think it's okay. We are very lenient <laughs> to ourselves. But when we see the fault of the others, hey, we even magnify it. It's very strange. Huh? I, I stand here, but I can see the, the little speck in your eyes, although I have very poor eyes. You know, I, I, I can't even read clearly what is written in the Bible here in the Word. But when I see Timo, it's very strange. I can see all the fault in Timo, even from far away. And Timo can even see more fault in me. I wonder what kind of a vision we have. Fallen vision. <laughs> It <laughs> is so strange. <laughs> and yet, I'm so near to myself, I don't see my own fault. And my own fault is much bigger than your fault. But I don't see it. Uh, this is our fallen human nature. This is our fallen human nature. But a kingdom people should not be this way. We have another life. We have the life of the heavenly Father within us. And we need to know this heavenly Father. Right. Right. It is not good. It is not good. That costs so much trouble. I'd rather just see my own self and tell the Lord, Lord, save me. Save me. Right. Otherwise, uh, if I'm not poor in spirit, I, th I thought I'm okay. I know the Bible, and uh, I'm better than you, and all this. If I think like this, I'm already fallen. Fallen, and I have a big plank in me. Right. That very thought in itself is a very dangerous plank. May the Lord have mercy on us. We have to be in the light, standing in the light of the Lord. Yeah. If we realize that we are so full of faults, I don't think you can criticize others very easily. Yeah. And if we see something, then it is not for us to criticize, but to pray and to help, and to supply the need, instead of criticizing. Your criticism will never help anyone. It will only hurt yourself, and it will destroy others. Amen. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, the Lord says. First, remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And this is really true. If I have not learned to deal with my own fault through Christ before the Lord, how can I help another person to remove his little fault? Not possible. It is not possible. And so this is the way the kingdom people deal with one another. This is how we have intercourse with one another. 
how we live together, our attitude, our relationship toward one another. Right? Instead of criticizing, you help. But if you want to help, you need to help yourself first to deal with your own problems. Because I cannot deal with somebody else's problem if I don't learn to deal with my own. It is not possible. Right. May the Lord help us. Oh, Lord Jesus. Uh, this morning, I picked up a couple of verses to go back <coughs> to talk about a point from yesterday concerning the matter of the riches, the riches. All of us have some kind of a riches. We are not poor, are you? Are you poor? No? You're poor? Who uh, uh, is homeless here? Are you poor? No, no. We all have some kind of a riches. Yesterday we talked about laying up treasures in heaven. But there is one point that is very important, which I feel I need to fellowship about it, is how do you deal with your riches? What do you do with it? Yeah. You have it. What are you going to do with it? Suppose the Lord comes in five years, let's say, yeah? I'm not saying he's going to come in five years. And at the end of the five years, you still have 10 million in your account. I don't know if you have or not, but I, I was just a, uh, of course, I don't have 10 millions. I don't know if you do. <laughs> okay, one million, how about that? Okay, 500,000. What are you going to do with that 500,000? Because it's going to turn into nothing. Right? So if, if you have something that's going to turn into nothing, well, you better do something about it, right? So what are you going to do something about it? Take cruise around the world 10 times a year? quickly go to safari, <laughs> take a vacation somewhere in Caribbean, <laughs> go to visit Florence, <laughs> go to visit uh, Amsterdam, Paris, and uh, <sighs> Venice before it sinks. <laughs> Quickly use your money to see the world. Go to China, climb the mountains. Right. What are you going to use the money for? You should convert that money into treasures in heaven. That kind of investment is a has an interest of uh, not just a hundred percent. I don't know how many, per how many hundred percent. <laughs> and this is, in essence, what the Lord is trying to say, to use your money wisely, faithfully, so that you can heap up treasures in heaven. You all know the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, right? Let us read Luke, chapter 16. <coughs> I'm trying to help you with the investment. Uh, le let's uh, talk about investment this morning. Uh, uh, I'm going to be your financial counselor. <laughs> investment. <laughs> this question was asked by so many 
people so many things because they because it sounds strange in Luke chapter 16 concerning the the uh, unfaithful stewards there was a certain rich man who had a steward and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods so I don't waste your goods yeah don't waste your goods so he called him and said to him what is this I hear about you give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be a steward you're fired <laughs> you're fired <laughs> and he was caught so he was going to be fired and the steward says well what shall I do my master is going to fire me I cannot dig I'm ashamed to beg what am I going to do right I have resolved what to do well he got a good idea that when I'm put out of the stewardship they they whatever I do to those people they're going to receive me into their houses so he called every one of his masters debtors to him and said to the first how much do you owe my master oh a hundred measures of oil so he quickly said yeah you know I'll help you right I'll help you take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50 of course, uh, the debtor, that, that debtor will be so happy. My goodness, you're my good friend. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> I really like you. <laughs> you're doing me a wonderful favor. Yeah, great. Right, uh, come, 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 let's have a drink first. <laughs> and so he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the, uh, yeah, and he said to the other one, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measure of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill, write 80. Write 80. And the master commended the unjust steward. Can you imagine this master commended? It doesn't mean that the master is not angry. Of course, the master is not happy, you know. But the master saw that this unjust steward, he's, uh, he's quite a guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's wise, he's quite a guy, <laughs> he's wise. But he's still fired, okay? <laughs> Don't think he's going to retain him. No, he's still fired, especially after what he has done because he had dealt shrewdly, wisely. But wise is too positive a word. It should be shrewd. It's shrewd. It's shrewd. Right. And then there is a comment here, for the sons of this world, this fallen people, are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Now, the Lord is not commending them here. But the Lord is telling us and showing us we have to be wise. Right. And then the Lord say, after saying this, <coughs> For I say to you, make friends for yourself through or by the unrighteous mammon mammon it's not a good word that when you fail or when it fails the mammon fails right the better translation the better greek text says when it fails when a mammon fails that means when the money lost its value and all of a sudden the stock market just turned to zero <laughs> Now, just dropped a few percent, a few points, but dropped a hundred points, then you're in trouble. Then money became useless, that they may receive you into an everlasting home. 
Then the Lord says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and what is least is money. Mammon, in the eyes of God, mammon means nothing. God did not create mammon. It is the enemy that created this money. And that is why Paul says the love of money is the root of all evil or is a root of all evil. But maybe the is right. <laughs> and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, now this is what the Lord says, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, this is a very uh, practical warning. Who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's now, and this is even a very enlightening warning, whose money is it in your account? No, you earned it. You, you worked in a company there, and you worked so hard, so you earned it. So whose money is it? <laughs> what? <laughs> Say it again. I didn't hear it. <laughs> Really? Have you ever considered that what you have, it is not yours, it is another man's? You're just a steward. The master owns it. In this very parable, the guy who deals with the money, it is not his money, it was the money of the steward. So what do you use with it? How, how do you... How do you Deal with that. If you consider that as your money, then you can do it whatever you like. You can buy this, you can buy that, you can buy oh, you can buy everything you want, right? You don't ask the Lord how to use it. Yep. So it is written here. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Because at the very end, you will lose what is your rightful inheritance that God wants to give you. God will not give you your rightful inheritance at the very end. This is very serious. So although money is just paper, okay, and then some coins, and nobody likes the coins except if it is pure gold or know, how many carat is pure? If we consider that as our own, then I can just dispose of it for my own benefits, for myself, for me, what I need. I don't care for the need of others. This is why in the heavenly kingdom that righteous deeds, the first works of righteousness is to give alms to remember the poor. You remember that rich man who came to the Lord Jesus and wanted to enter into the kingdom? What did the Lord say to him? At the very end, uh, firstly, he says, you do what Moses says, all the commandments, keep it. Right? So he said, I kept all. You think he really kept all? <laughs> <laughs> At least he didn't keep one. Covetousness, he didn't keep that. He held on to it. And the Lord told him, well... One more thing is lacking. If you do that, 
he will enter into the kingdom. Sell all and give it to the poor. No, it's not just sell all, but you use it correctly. You give it to the poor to help the poor. Today, what the Lord has given us is just for us to dispense of it wisely. Give it to the needy ones, not to the lazy ones, okay? And, and didn't say give it to the pastors. No, 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 so that they can fly in, in jets and have private jets, uh, $50 million jet. Oh, don't do that. This is crazy. But to the many needy saints, do good to everyone. Paul says in Galatians, especially to the household of God. Right. Use it wisely. Use it to make friends. And to make friends, we don't have time. Yeah. It's not just to dispense money. Uh, you have a wonderful home, right? Open up for hospitality. Right. Invite not just the rich people to come to your home. Invite your friends at work for the gospel. Use your home to make friends for the kingdom. They're not going to repay you, but the word of God in Luke chapter 12 says God will repay you. They cannot repay you. But God is going to repay you. So whatever good things you do with the mammons of unrighteousness that will bring glory to God, will help those who are truly in need, not just those who are going to take advantage of your money. No. Right? Be wise. Be discerning. Right? If a thief comes to your house and wants to steal your money, you, you, you just give him alms. Uh, no, you better call the police, okay? <laughs> yeah. That's not what it meant. But you, be, you should be discerning. Tell the Lord, Lord, how can I use this money so that I can lay up the treasures in heaven? How can I convert this mammon of unrighteousness to heavenly treasures? Well, that is a good investment. Don't you think so? Right. That's a very good investment. The heavenly people must be good investors. You have to be the best investors. Praise the Lord. May the Lord open our eyes. May the Lord show us what we should do. So don't think in the heavenly kingdom we are just reading the Bible and talking about the Lord and singing songs and bring offerings to the Father, and that's it. No, it touches every areas of our life. It touches even our relationship to each other. To take care of one another. Not to criticize one another. Right? Not to look down with contempt on the condition of other saints. But pray. We should pray for them. We should help not to criticize, not to judge. Oh, Lord Jesus, may the Lord help us. Right. And then, but on the other hand, in chapter 7, the Lord says, do not give what is holy to the dogs. That means, hey, don't just throw away the good things. Don't waste it. You have to be discerning, discerning. Don't just say, oh, the Bible tells me to help the poor. And why you just help all the lazy ones and uh, give them money so that they uh, say, I don't have to work. 
There are a lot of Christians giving me money, so why should I work? Paul says, if you don't work, you should also not eat. You're very healthy. Go to work. Right. Anyway, there is also a warning here. Yeah. Do not give what is holy to the dogs. <laughs> the dogs are very unclean animals there and fears. They can bite. So be careful if you give them a piece of meat, they might eat your fingers and your hands. They'll bite you. Nor cast your pearls before swine. A swine may not bite, but they will not appreciate what you tell them, and they will trample them underfoot, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you <laughs> even into pieces at the very end, right? They will not appreciate it, and not only they will not appreciate it, they will be angry with you. Yeah. And so we need discernment. We need discernment. Praise the Lord. Ah, we don't have time. But the rest, you don't need to. Ah, expl explanation because it is so clear. Right. We need to ask the Lord. We need to seek. We need to knock. Our Heavenly Father will give us everything that we need to enter into the kingdom. Praise the Lord. Amen.